The United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland, a land steeped in history, tradition and a complex national character. The notion of Britishness has really evolved over time. It used to be Englishness. What defined the nation was really the ability to hold the country together, the Queen, and then the rest followed. What is Britain to the many different people who make up the population of these isles today? When the British people have chosen to move away from a European identity and along a more isolationist path, the Brexit debate centred on immigration and fear, and now the split from Europe looms on the horizon, just a few years after Scotland narrowly voted to remain in the United Kingdom. But what is British identity? There's a stereotype of Britishness. It's a brand exported across the world. It's sold on postcards, tea towels, and TV shows watched around the globe. Britishness is about tolerance, patience and acceptance. Being part of a family and being part of a large community, you feel welcome. Winter country walks. I feel like it's almost a costume that you have to put on, um, but only some people can wear all of the pieces uh, and I'm only wearing a few bits. It's a dynamic, ongoing thing. It's a story that will continue. But there is also a different side to Britishness. As everyone knows, there's nothing more British than a cup of tea. But there have never actually been any tea plantations in Britain. Fish and chips is as British as it gets. But this dish is actually the legacy of Portuguese immigrants who came to England in the 16th century. Britishness is not a thing, it's a contested idea. It kind of changes over time. Highly political and often contradictory idea. I'm Miriam Francois and in this episode of Compass I want to explore the idea of Britishness. I was born in the UK to parents who were economic migrants to this country and yet I've never really felt British. It's clear that I'm not alone in having a complex relationship to the country of my birth so I want to find out what it means to be British in 2017. The people I'll meet are using their creativity to redraw British identity. I'll travel across the country to try and understand why some people feel excluded from the idea of Britishness. The artists on my journey are retelling stories of the past to build an idea of Britishness that is more reflective of the present and forge a more inclusive future. This is a city that was at the heart of Britain's industrial revolution, a manufacturing powerhouse. Today, Birmingham is one of the most diverse cities in the UK. Nearly a third of its residents are of minority ethnic origin. And here, a group of creatives are using their art to challenge traditional narratives of Britishness. Among them, decolonizing British heritage. Yasmina Silva and Raza Hussein are both poets. They're using the spoken word to question what it really means to be British. Typed whilst running through a concrete jungle, typos and graze knees as the protagonist stumbles. This head wrap will be political. It will say that I am as old as humanity itself. It will say I am here. They brought me to this exhibition called The Past Is Now. It aims to show a fuller picture of the history of empire and explore other perspectives which have not been represented. As we wandered through the exhibition, we happened on some more typical images from British history. The fact that these are the sorts of images that are usually represented in our museums, in our galleries. I mean, what story does this tell about Britishness? It makes me wonder what people actually know about Britishness outside of just England? Like, do they know about colonialism and the atrocities there? The British Empire was phenomenal um, in, in, in the way that they orchestrated um, their, their rule over most of the world. Um, but to know 
the ways in which they did them and to know that they were celebrated for their methods is, is the scary part of it. What do paintings like this make you feel about Britishness? I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm British, but I know that I can't relate to that. If you're talking about, oh, Birmingham is brilliant, it's got loads of canals. Those canals were built to ship guns to the colonies um, and kind of it's, it was a big chain making centre. Chains were used and they were sent to the Americas to uh, kind of shackle enslaved peoples. Um, so it's kind of this kind of dichotomy of making sure that you're telling this story but you're telling all of the other stories as well. One of the things that's been lacking in Britain is any acknowledgement that Britain had a colonial past and it shapes the present and that colonial past was violent, it was based upon exploitation and it wasn't this kind of benevolent project in which we went out simply to give some roads and some railways and some democracy and, and some literature to the various parts of the world. So part of the problem today I think is that Britain even today still hasn't confronted that legacy in an honest way and that allows I think for the perpetration of racial inequalities in the present because in a sense the past isn't even acknowledged and understood fully. But not everyone in Britain thinks the legacy of empire is a negative one. In fact, 59% of people think the British Empire is something to be proud of, while 19% feel ashamed of it. A third of the country would like it to still exist. I want to try and better understand what this says about the UK and the complex relationship between people's identity and the ideas of Britishness that we find in our history books. So I've come to a school in East London to meet someone who's trying to give a more rounded picture of Britain's history. Paul Crooks is an author and historian. He aims to inspire young people to uncover more about their history. Black history, what does it mean? The first thing that comes into your mind? Slavery. You think of slavery, what do you think of? There's no positive way for slavery, but when we think about it, we've done a lot of stuff. Come across examples where you know, um, young people have believed that black people were only ever slaves. And if we're talking about the last 400 years of history, yeah, there's a certain truth to that, but it's not the whole truth. And when you give these sessions, um, what do you hope that the children will take away from them? I'd get them to look at uh, black culture, black history, and the contribution to black British history with more appreciative eyes. Black history doesn't begin with slavery. For me, the big picture is about empowerment you know, and your ability to make a wider contribution to society. That historical legacy of Britishness being tied to, um, if you like, kind of colonial domination with the whites at the top was never really contested, you know, was always there. So even in those kind of, in that decolonial moment when they have the anti-colonial struggles, there's still a notion of those, those countries breaking away from Britain, but Britain itself is staying white, which of course then raises the question, well, suppose you are black or Asian and British, you know, what's your place within society? If identity is about where you're from, what happens if your ancestors are written out of history? I realised how important it is for young people in Britain to be able to see themselves in their country's past. Or as the next person on my journey put it, as my mum used to say, it's always good to see your face. And if your face is denied, you don't see your face, then you, 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 it, it comes back to self-worth. Am I part of society? Michael is doing just that. He's highlighting the presence of black people in 16th century Britain, debunking the idea that slavery was the beginning of an African presence in England. John Blank was the black trumpeter to the courts of Henry VII and Henry VIII. He was significant because what is the first person of African descent who both have an image of and a record, which is, and, that, and that's reflected in his entry in the Oxford Edition National Biography. But for me, and many people, it's significant in the fact that he was there. He was there, because often there's, a, there's a, a denial that there were black people in Tudor times, and there were. Not much is known about John Blank, so Michael has asked contemporary artists to reimagine his story. The stuff plan is imagine the black Tudor trumpeter. And that's the important thing. To get people his imagination that there's a person who we can reinvent him. We can because we know a little bit about him. Well, let's extemporize. Let's conject. Let's move it forward. Let's move the narrative. Let's create different things about him based on what we what, what we know, what we understand. Because all pro, all human progress is made on imagination. One of the things about national identity is that it's imagined and therefore the symbols become really important. Who are we, the, the narratives, the stories that we give to kind of bind us together, the kind of the social glue if you like. 
and therefore artists play a really important role because they ask these questions. Not only who are we, but who could we be? More than 50 artists have played a part in shaping this story. Adelaide de Moa has spent months working on her interpretation of John Blank. She's forging his identity by blending elements of her own past with that of John Blank. The start of my artistic process is body printing. So I usually will cover myself in paint and print onto the canvas to form an imprint of myself and leave that. And then from there, I overlay with images. So this, that's the image of John Blank. Um, and I also overlay with text to tell stories. So on this particular piece, I'm telling the story of John Blank as I saw him. Who was John Blank the way that you imagined him? I went back to um, myself and I started thinking about what it meant to be black and British. And then I started thinking about um, the journey that my parents took to get here. If he was African, his name would not have been John. And then I thought, my dad's name is John. <laughs> my dad's name is John Damoa. And, um, and so then I just started imagining him as my dad. And then that's where it started from. And when my dad came to this country, and my dad's name is actually Kwame, right? And, but people had difficulty saying Kwame, so then he adopted John. The John Blank Project shows the power that artists have to reinterpret and build on stories of the past to bring back to life the forgotten. There is a danger when you think about what's presented in the media consistently, historically and currently um, of presenting a single story or a stereotype of who black people are and I'm kind of sick and tired of bored to tears of seeing that single story. Adelaide has connected her own personal history and identity with the forgotten history of John Blank, linking the past and the present through her work. Artists have the freedom to rethink ideas about Britishness. Artists can be provocative, irreverent, commemorative, and they, are, they force people to rethink their, their, their views of the world, but also their views of their own community. History, as the saying goes, is told by the victors. But what of the stories of people who are left out of history? The story of John Blank has made me think about the people that never made it into the textbooks. That's why I'm crossing the channel to France. This structure is called the Ring of Remembrance and it contains the names of over half a million soldiers of over 40 different nationalities who all died in World War I. Here, 40,000 soldiers who lost their lives in the First World War are buried. Among them are 500 Muslim soldiers from the former colonies who fought for the Allies. Not taking centre stage in the history books, these people's heroics in the Great War are often forgotten. And now the stories of these soldiers, Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, who all fought for Europe's freedom is finally being heard. We have an identity crisis when we were in the UK and dealing what it means to be Muslim, what it means to be British. Uh, the soldiers were going through the exact same thing. This tour has been organized to remind people of the forgotten history of Muslim soldiers. Some of the relatives of the soldiers who fought for the British say that their story has been buried and with it an important chapter in British history. Dilawa Chowdhury's great uncle fought in World War I as part of the colonial Indian regiments who were supporting Britain. He feels their sacrifice has been forgotten. My great uncle and his colleagues' contribution and in their involvement in this campaign, it makes me so proud. It's so important that they need to be recognized, they need to be acknowledged, they need to be respected. As we're living in a diverse country, we need to be including all elements of it and we need to be a part of everything. The soldiers buried here made the ultimate sacrifice. And speaking to some of the people on the tour, it's clear that they don't feel like that sacrifice is being acknowledged and that with it, an important part of British history is being ignored.
Back in the UK, one artist is making sure that a part of Britain's much more recent history is not being ignored. I've come to Brighton on the south coast of England to meet an award-winning visual artist. Sarah Maple was born in the UK to Muslim and Christian parents. Her art explores issues of identity and her own mixed heritage. She's brought me to Brighton, that most British of seaside towns. It's near to where Sarah grew up and holds special significance for her. Artists are always asking us to think about where we're from, who we are and who we might become. Why did you bring us here to Brighton Pier today to talk about your work? I mean, what's the significance of this location to you as an artist? I actually lived here when I was at art school. One of the first performances that I did was when I came to Brighton Pier and I dressed in a burqa and I walked around and I got someone to kind of stalk me from afar and take pictures of me and people's reactions. I think Brexit has made everyone question British identity and I think people almost feel like they're losing something or something's been, like, something's been taken away from them and so it's a very emotive subject. And what emotions are you hoping people will have when they see that picture? I think I want people to feel uncomfortable, I think, you know. One of the main things I wanted to put across is what does it mean to be British? And I feel ashamed of these slogans, you know, and it's just, I think it's really jarring to see this beautiful teacup, this beautiful idea of Britain, you know, and then you've got this horrible thing with, next, written on it. Sarah took me to pick up some posters from a nearby shop for a new piece she's working on. You've brought me to this wonderful vintage shop. Why are we here? I just wanted to sort of maybe make a collage or a painting or something, so I'm just having a look through some of these. So we could do with thousands more like you, join the Women's Land Army. And look how idyllic, old England, you know. And do you think there's nostalgia today for this kind of imagery, or do you think people have kind of updated their notion of Britishness? Just as much as this is like an idea, I think that people have got that idea in their mind during Brexit, that idea again of like, going to keep Britain for the British. Many of the dominant notions of Britishness are really versions of Englishness and a very idyllic, um, sometimes even kind of pre-industrial notion of England being the land of you know, the green and pleasant lands of, of, of England. And in that moment, the kind of industrial core gets kind of left out of, of that identity. Um, class kind of gets left out, interestingly. This is the seat of government, the Houses of Parliament in London. It's the centre of legislation and policy for the entire country. The decisions here are made by a tiny number of people in a privileged location in the capital, but inevitably influence society and culture across the UK. But here in Wales, it's the people in the building behind me who make at least some of the decisions. It's been 20 years since the Welsh Government was given limited independent powers, and that's provided a real boost to identity and culture, but some say it simply hasn't gone far enough. Griff Lynch is a musician and filmmaker. He's British, but his first language is not English. He doesn't identify as British and makes most of his music in his native tongue, Welsh. You do feel proud of, of being Welsh and you feel like, you know, you, you need to make an effort to create and carry on creating through this medium because it is a dying culture, it's a dying language. So do you feel like making art in Welsh is political for you? It does inevitably have that political edge because it's being created in a minority language, in a culture that's not seen around the world all the time. So I've made that decision instantly before making a song or before doing a film. So then you've got to think, well, yeah, there's a sort of political aspect there because if I didn't care about the politics, I'd make an English song and I'd, and I'd do a, an English film because I'd get more money, <laughs> essentially. Is your music British? No, no, my music isn't British.
Wales has long been one of the creative hubs of the UK. And much of Welsh music and art has been political, wrapped up with Welsh identity. Griff brought me to the Senedd, the seat of government in Wales. Has devolution made you feel like Wales is more recognised in the concept of Britishness? Welsh politics has developed and it's definitely helped Welsh identity. You know, people in all around Wales, they, they know that there is something here. The difference between Englishness and Britishness is really uh, important. Most English people would say they're British. Most Welsh people would say they're Welsh and then British, and sometimes just Welsh. So I think there's a position of power and privilege. So what is British identity? And was it a lack of national identity that partly led to the Brexit vote? A sense of British identity is perhaps more unclear than ever before. But one musician and political activist is shaping a new vision through his music. Loki is British Iraqi and one of Britain's most well-known independent hip-hop artists. His music often engages with issues of identity and power. I'd arranged to meet Loki in his local area, just streets away from the Grenfell Tower, the site of one of the worst disasters in British modern history. In the early hours of June 14th, 2017, a fire engulfed the central London building, leaving 71 of its residents dead. I think from the time of empire that Britishness has actually included a sense of the spectatorship of suffering. This incident in a way is symptomatic of that same phenomena whereby the people that died in that building know a secret about our civilization that I think we may not know. I wanted to try and better understand his take on Britishness and how he was using his creative talent to engage with those issues. Do you feel British? To me, I don't actually consider myself as belonging to or giving myself to any nationality. If we think about what we define as British values, some will say democracy. That's great, but the people at Peterloo were massacred for demonstrating for democracy. How many of us are taught that? This idea that history is top heavy, that it's always defined by people in positions of political power, rather than the movements below it, is a mythology, is a lie, and needs to be demystified completely. Loki's vision is one of solidarity between people and cultures, which transcends nationalism. A global community beyond borders and nations. The artists I've met on this journey have been working to redefine the concept of Britishness. They're using their art to challenge the dominant narrative, to question the assumptions and stereotypes of traditional British values, and to bring about a more complete and inclusive vision of identity for the future. You can be the person you want to be, because your identity is a construct. The artists I've met are drawing a modern version of British identity. My identity is very layered, that's a fact. I have liberated myself from senses of belonging to imagined communities. Casting aside stereotypes of Britishness to create a freer and more open forum for a fresh 21st century British identity. It's not the multiculturalism of, of state policies, it's an ordinary lived multiculture in which black and white people shop together and they eat together and they watch sports together and they even become lovers and produce new types of family structures. Without all of these different communities contributing, whether good or bad, we, we made this place what it is today. What it means to be British has always been in flux 
And what I've realised from speaking to the artists is that right now, the idea of Britishness is more fluid than ever. National identity is back in the spotlight. The fallout from Brexit, Scotland's future in the Union, and growing calls to confront the legacy of colonialism have all added to that debate. Now, the artists I've been speaking to are using their craft to challenge those issues and to create new spaces in which hybrid identities exist as fully British. And in so doing, they're forging a fairer and ultimately more accurate picture of Britishness.